so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be included in this. And um, I've read the book. It's an incredible book. And I just think that um, having, having this group of people come together to celebrate Elizabeth is absolutely uh, wonderful. And I wanted to set the tone for this conversation that Elizabeth and I will be having by introducing uh, someone many of you might already know. Uh, Barbara Sc Scott is a Calgarian musician and author. Her first collection, The Quick, won the City of Calgary W.O. Mitchell Award, W.O. Mitchell Book Prize, and the Writers Guild uh, Howard O'Hagan Award. Uh, not insubstantial awards. Her second book, a novel entitled Taste of Hunger, will be published by Freehand Books next year in 2022. Now, um, Barbara has agreed to set the tone with a little bit of Cuban music, and I'm going to invite her to set us up for this conversation with Elizabeth around the errant husband. Go ahead, Barbara. Thank you. Well, I too am just delighted to be here, Elizabeth. It's a wonderful milestone, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it. I'm going to be playing <clears throat> two songs, the first, Black Orpheus by Luis Bonfa and Antonio Maria, and the second, Quizás, 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 by Osvaldo Farris and Joe Davis. <laughs> I'll sing to the sun in the sky. I'll sing while the sun rises high. Carnival time is here. Magical time will be. And as that time draws near, dreams lift my heart. I'll sing while I play my I'll sing to this dream from afar Will love come my way on this carnival day Or will love wait in my heart Will true love come my way on this magical day? Or will love always wait in my dreams? I say you love me, and so how am I ever to know you only tell me kisses, kisses, kisses. A million times I've asked you, and then I ask you over again. You only answer, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. If you can't make your mind up, we'll never get started. And I don't want to wind up being parted and broken hearted. So if you really love me, say yes. But if you don't, dear, confess. Just please don't tell me, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Siempre que te pregunto que cuando, como y donde, tú siempre me respondes, quizás, quizás, quizás. Y así pasan los días y yo desesperando y tú, tú contestando, quizás, quizás, quizás. Estás perdiendo el tiempo pensando, pensando por lo que más tú quieras, hasta cuando, hasta cuando. Y así pasó los días 
y yo desesperando y tú, tú contestando. Quizás, 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 quizás. Thanks, Elizabeth. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muy bonito. Uh -huh. Beautiful, beautiful rendition of those Spanish songs. Thank you so much, Barb. Um, I The main event is uh, Elizabeth. And I do want to, uh, I've known Elizabeth for a while. And um, quite a while, in fact. I saw this book in its infancy. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about her officially before I tell you some unofficial things about her and her writing and her great talent. Um, I first want to say thank you and congratulations. It's so incredible to be celebrating this with you. Elizabeth's fiction and nonfiction have appeared in magazines, including Alberta Views, The New Quarterly, The Malahat Review, Prism, Room, um, anthologies. She's been in Shy, Waiting, and uh, the recent You Look Good for Your Age, all of them University of Alberta Press books. She's won uh, the John White Memorial Essay Competition, an Alberta Book Award, and the Western Magazine Award for Fiction, and the America Heart Award for her fiction. Her short story collection, Speak Mandarin, Not Dialect, published by Thistledown Press, was a finalist for the Alberta Book Awards. And uh, Elizabeth has studied writing and worked in writing through the University of Victoria, the University of Calgary, um, the Wired Writing Studio at UBC, and Booming Ground at um, the University of British Columbia. Not counting the novel she wrote when she was in grade six, this is actually her first novel. So, and it's a delight. Um, I, I rarely, I, I often laugh in novels, but in The Errant Husband, I laughed out loud many times. And I have to tell you, it also brought me to tears. It's one of those books, my friends, that is um, serious, uh, content wise, but rendered with this lightness of tone that 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 is an absolute delight to read. And this wry voice uh, penetrates every scene, a completely engaging book. Um, I think I'm going to start with with what I think is the most important thing, Elizabeth. It's clear that it, it wouldn't be giving too much away to say The Errant Husband is a plot-driven quest book. We are looking for someone, an errant husband. Um, but I also think that it's very much character-driven. And I want to start with Thelma. She's our protagonist. She's our every woman. Um, she is an introspective underachiever, a uh, city of Calgary Parks and Recreation middle manager, nursing unfulfilled dreams in academia and archeology. span I, I need to know where she came from. Like, where did this quirky person come from and, and how did she come? I think I am unmuted, yes. Um, yeah, the great question question, Margaret. Um, she's no one I know, but uh, obviously some of her thoughts and her ideas come from me. Uh, she definitely says things that I wish I could say out loud, which I don't. I just say them in my head. Um, I think she evolved as I was writing the book. I wanted to write about a woman who wasn't maybe an easy woman, but was funny, was creative, was lonely, had unfulfilled dreams, was efficient. You know, she's a middle manager. She, you know, gets things going in Parks and Rec, but, but didn't really ever do what she wanted to do in life because of a number of um, situations. Um, so, yeah, I think she evolved as I wrote her, and I really came to like her. Uh, in some earlier versions of the novel, I 
some of my early readers said, oh, she's not that nice. She's a bit mean. And so I guess I toned her down a little bit. But I, yeah, I, I didn't want her to be an easy woman. I wanted her to be a, a challenging woman, uh, a kind woman. You know, she'd be the, the kind of friend who, if you went shopping with her, she'd say, oh, no, that looks terrible on you. Makes your butt look way too big. Um, but she'd also come to the hospital if you were in crisis and do what needed to be done. Um, so yeah, she, I, she feels like a friend because yeah. I don't know her for 20 years <laughs> as I've been writing her <laughs> yeah she's uh, this is what they call the round character I mean she's not she's everything mm -hmm. um she's she's uh she's flawed which I I think that's why I identified with her because she is deeply flawed as mm -hmm. we all are um the errant husband is a literary work uh with these intricately revealed symbols and layers upon layers of meaning throughout the entire text. And it's it's a excavation in itself as you read, because I just kept on discovering more and more things as I read the novel. And I know because when we first got together and I looked at earlier drafts of this book, I know that it has been a long time in the making. I think it was maybe 2000 and I that you and I worked together or yeah. or yeah it was a long time ago when we were in a writing group together and I I'm you say it's evolved but I'm wondering if it if if the idea came to you fully formed over those 15 20 years or if if it was sort of um the t the uh, building of the story itself. How did it work? I want to know a little bit more mm -hmm. about your process over those twenty years. But that's a long time, but the end result is is really worth it. So tell me about your process. Mm, yeah, great question. Um, I wish I had an outline. I wish I knew exactly how it was going to go, but I didn't. Um, I didn't really know how to write a novel. I just wrote scenes. So I'd write a scene and a scene and a scene. And then I got carried away and I did research and I wrote all kinds of scenes about Cuba and the revolution, which didn't make it in the novel. And then I kind of took those scenes and uh, put them in order. So Anne Fleming, who was my wonderful uh, mentor at Banff Wired Studio, had suggested putting scenes on index cards. So I did. And then I shuffled those around. Um, I, had the, I had the novel once in chronological order. So Calgary going to Cuba, and then I mixed it up, and I went Calgary, Cuba, Cuba, Calgary, Cuba, then, then started in Cuba. Um, I had big swaths of backstory that I made into just smaller scenes or even smaller, um, you know, paragraph, paragraphs or pages, so I didn't distract too much with backstory, but yeah, I don't, I didn't really know how to write a novel, so it definitely evolved. It was like a jigsaw puzzle putting it together. Well, we're grateful that you we're grateful that you did not abandon it. You did not yeah. abandon it. It's it's a it is a it is a very intricate weaving and it is a a fabulous read. I I will not talk about how fabulous. I'm sure our audience will want to hear from you. So I would invite you um I would invite the audience to meet our amazing protagonist Thelma. I think this is from the top of the book, isn't it? It is. And I realized that I'm I'm kind of at an odd, you, you just say the bottom of my head and I'm going to be looking down. So I'm going to put my chair up a bit if I can. So fancy, well, no, that's not it. Fancy new office chair that I got. Uh, okay, that doesn't go up very high. Okay, there we go. I guess you'll still be able to see me. Um, yeah, so I will be reading from the beginning of, a, of the book. Uh, my apologies for the bad Spanish. I have studied Spanish, but uh, my accent could use some work. So uh, yeah, here's the prologue. In the city of Havana, where Avenida del Puerto meets Desemparado, stands El Castillo de la Real Fuerza, the first and oldest of four forts guarding Havana Harbor. Built in 1558, it is surrounded by limestone walls six meters thick. Tourists can saunter inside the cannon-studded courtyard, cross the moat by drawbridge, 
admire the suits of armor, then climb to the top of the round tower for views of old Havana and the sea. On top of that tower is La Heraldia, a bronze weather vane of a woman in a diaphanous gown holding a scepter, her crowned head held high, scanning the ocean. She is Isabel de Bobadilla, wife of conquistador Hernando de Soto. He sailed away to conquer Florida in 1539, leaving her to govern the island. He did not return. Chapter one, Cuba, 2005. All of the tourists from Thelma's flight pushed their luggage carts through the glass doors of the international airport into the brilliant Havana afternoon. Customs officials gather around a couple of expatriate Cubans, leaving a scowling young woman in a tight blue uniform to look after the rest of them. She stares at Thelma's new espadrilles for a moment, then nods her past. Outside, warm air caresses her. Men in star starched white guayaberas and black pants wave signs. Mr. and Mrs. Marco, Familia Santa Cruz, Havana Tour, Amis Tour, Hotel Melia Cohiba. Thelma pulls her suitcase over to a stone bench and searches for Wally. The waiting crowd surges forward with every whoosh of the glass doors, but Wally is nowhere to be seen. Maybe he's waiting further down the sidewalk where there are fewer people. She pulls her suitcase away from the entrance, stopping to smell some flowers. Jasmine, heavenly. A man appears at her side. Taxi, senora, he whispers. No, thanks. Another man flanks her. Where are you going? The second man asks. Nowhere. Nowhere, that is just outside of Havana. I can drive you there very cheap, he says, flashing a grin and stroking his mustache. I'm waiting for my husband. Your husband is Cuban, asked the first man, who is thin and clean shaven. Canadian, Thelma replies, looking past him to a guy in Bermuda shorts and wrinkled t-shirt who could be, but isn't, Wally. He is working here, asked the thin man. No. Yeah, yeah doing some research. He's writing. What is he writing? A novel based on Hernando de Soto, the first governor of Cuba. Well, according to my husband, his wife Isabel did most of the governing. Es verdad, said the guy with the mustache. Do you know that Isabel de Bobadilla is a weather vane La Heraldia on top of El Castillo de la Real Fuerza? It is because she went to the tower every afternoon to see if Hernando was returning yet from Florida. She is also the symbol on the Havana Club rum bottle. Yes, I do. Well, she didn't know about the rum. Ah, you are helping your husband in his researches. No, I'm meeting him for a vacation. A marriage renewal holiday, actually, but he didn't need to know that. And I don't need a taxi, says Thelma. With a dismissive smile, she returns to crowd scanning. Wally probably went to the Museum of the Revolution and lost track of time in the Che Room or to the Grandma Memorial, though how much time one could spend staring at a boat, even one as apparently illustrious as the one that transported Fidel and his fellow travelers to Cuba to start the revolution, Thelma doesn't know. She slouches out of her sweater and takes a deep breath of the perfumed air. She can feel her winter hard skin softening already. Long flight, asked the thin man. He's still here? Yes. You're here for how long? Two weeks. I hope you enjoy your stay. Many Canadians come here to escape your cold winter. I myself have seen snow when I studied in Leningrado, says the mustachioed man. Only thing that kept him warm was Russian girls. I bet. She smiles and turns back to the main entrance. Maybe she missed seeing Wally inside. I don't need a taxi, she repeats. My husband is coming. I am Jorge, says the thin man, and he is Tomas. If we can be of assistance, we... Great, I'll keep you in mind. The sun has disappeared behind the palms. The doors open only sporadically now, disgorging hassled-looking Cubans and Cuban foreigner pairs. 
She's been waiting for 48 minutes. The taxis and minibuses that were lined up against the curb have all filled with happy vacationers and chugged off into the sunset. Where the hell is Wally? The men appear beside her. Tomas leans against a pillar and lights a cigarette. Your husband is not here? No, listen, do you have a cell? Cell? He looks around, lowers his voice. You would like to sell dollars, buy pesos? I sell for my husband. Tomas wrinkles his forehead. You have some tissues of your husband for testing at one of our hospitals, senora? I need a cell phone. Cell phone, he says, as if trying to figure out how the two words might go together. A cell phone, a mobile phone. She gestures, opening one. Para llevar, no, that's takeout. Para llamar a mi esposo. You need to call your husband? Yes, he's a bit absent-minded. He probably got the flight time wrong. The two men talk, then Tomas fires a burst of Spanish at her. Mas despacio, please. Another volley from Jorge. Gentlemen, por favor, my Spanish is es, esta no bueno. You need a mobile phone, yes? Very small and very uh, portatile? Portable. Portable, yes. Our phone system here is, how do you say it? Un poco antiquado, adds Jorge. Right. How do you say it? Antiquated. Antiquated, repeats Jorge. Is that correct? She's not an English teacher. Yes. And cell phones. Nobody has one, as Tomas. We have a Cuba cell company, but ordinary Cubans like us, we do not even have regular phones in our homes. Where can I find a public phone then? Tomas gestures inside the terminal and sighs. Mostly our phones don't work so well. Hungarian equipment, you know. Jorge frowns. Yes, Hungarian. From before 1991 in the special period. Maybe you will get a line, maybe you won't. Maybe you have to wait, try many times. Light is leaching from the sky. Where the hell is Wally? She wrote down her flight details and put them with his ticket so he wouldn't lose them. Senora, we will take you to your hotel. There are no more flights and there will be no more minibuses, no taxis. Maybe your husband is ill. Thelma sighs. He better be. If he's not, she is going to kill him or injure him badly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's Thelma. She is quirky. She is caustic. She is flawed, as I've said. And um, there's, there's, there's just something about that voice that gets inside, it's contemporary, it's a very contemporary voice. And yet you have chosen, Elizabeth, to pair it with sort of the conquistadors and Isabel, uh, Isabel de Soto and his wife, Isabel Bobeo. I want to speak, I just want you to tell me what prompted you to, um, take a very contemporary woman, hope, hope, woman hoping for a marriage renewal, having her travel to Cuba, and then this huge juxt juxtaposition with um, the historic woman waiting for her man to return. What can you say about the role of women and the role of waiting in this novel? Yeah, very good uh, question. I think women have always waited, women continue to wait. Um, I was interested in, in the idea of, of waiting and what that means. In fact, um, an early title choice that, thank you, Judy Miller, for this one, um, was Tell Me When. So I don't know if you know the song, Quando, 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 but Tell Me Quando, Tell Me When. And so the idea of, of waiting. So Thelma's really waited for her whole life, kind of for her, her life to start. Um, this marriage renewal holiday was supposed to be kind of a restart. And so um, I guess I'll, I'll back up and say I went to Cuba at first in 1997. And that's when I think I first saw La Heraldia, the uh, Isabella top of the tower. And I got interested in her, especially she was a, a governor in the 16th century. How did she become a governor? And then I started to research, but of course there's lots on De Soto, thousands of pages. Uh, as Thelma remarks in when talking about Wally's novel about the Soto, but 
very little about Isabel de Bobadilla, his wife. We know that her husband was also a conquistador, uh, Pedro Darius. He was uh, a conquistador in Panama and in Nicaragua. We know that she was convent educated. Uh, we know that she married late. Um, and, you know, I started to think about this woman alone in Havana because she got there and her husband decided he was going to Florida to look for gold and supposedly the fountain of youth. So, uh, yeah, the idea of a woman going every day waiting for her husband to come back just as Wally uh, has disappears and Thelma is waiting and really has been waiting her whole life. Um, so I like the idea of, of juxtaposing those two. Very good. I found her, um, wait, you said waiting to start her life, but Thelma in some ways is really rooted in and, and stuck almost in her own personal past. Mm -hmm. um, she's a woman hankering after, and I'm going to quote the book, she's, she's hankering after excavations, studying the things people left behind, things they throw away, things hidden deep in the earth. And I was uh, really impressed with the, um, the, the sort of geographical um, structure of Cuba and uh, the, the um, imagery that you conjured of caves and cenotes, architectural digs, underground waterways. Um, it, it, it's part of her misadventure, her quest to find Wally, but it really does explore that idea of, of the past. Tell me about those geographical formations and images of the natural world, the stalagmites, the quarries, the ancient skeletal sea creatures, limestones. How did you use that and why did you use that to um, illustrate Thelma's subconscious mind? Yeah, interesting. Well, Thelma's uh, father was a geologist, and so she grew up uh, being interested in mountains and rock formations. He would take her on field trips. They'd go camping in the mountains. She was particularly interested in limestone, and uh, I guess I'm particularly in, interested in limestone as a metaphor, the idea that it's porous, that water can go through it and make caves, so these underground caves or cenotes are, are featured, or well, they're water filled, uh, and then underneath them can be caves. Uh, I think I got that right, geologists can correct me. Um, and so the idea of water, the idea that water can form things, like water can make stalagmites and stalactites. Um, and also I thought it would be an interesting metaphor for her life, so her life, um, you know, things percolate in from the past and kind of get stuck. And I won't tell you how they get stuck, but they get stuck in her body, they get stuck in her mind. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting metaphor. Plus, I, I love water. I love images of water. I love swimming in water. So, uh, yeah, I think the idea of what water can do and, and rock and the erosion, I thought was uh, interesting. And I thought, could be used metaphorically. And again, I don't plan this all out. It just kind of happens. I'm like, oh, I think there's going to be some limestone caves in this book. And then I just write them. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's, I mean, you can see the great care that's been taken in connecting all these things throughout the, uh, the book. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away. And this is the trick of this is not giving too much away, but, um, uh, Thelma eventually does take that ride with Tomas. And um, I would like you to, it's much further on in the novel. It takes, uh, the scene takes place in a cenote in the uh, near, uh, uh, what's the name of the town? They're trying to track Wally. They're trying to go to Cienfuegos, but they get, they're in the uh, Zapata swamp area. Yeah. <laughs> yes, where the limestone caves are, the cenote. Mm -hmm. I'd invite you to then, read from this portion of the book. It's quite a wonderful portion and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is uh, chapter 24, again in Cuba. The walk to the cenote is taking forever. He said it was close, but they've been walking for under a heavy sun for 15 minutes now, walking apparently on limestone riddled with faults. This is the Zapata Peninsula, 
an area that was sparsely populated until Fidel Castro caught wind of the planned Bay of Pigs invasion and gathered the Carboneros, the charcoal burn burners, and students, gave them Czech rifles and Stalinist tanks to repel the US invaders, Cuban exiles. Well, Tomas didn't tell her all of this. She knows it from her guidebook. I can't believe Kathy and Jorge didn't want to come swimming. It's so beautiful here. This white road, the screen of trees behind us, says Thelma, as beautiful as a painting. Or perhaps more so, being the real thing and all, Tomas. A talented painter could make it more beautiful, brighten the browns and soften the blues. A talented painter such as yourself, sir? Perhaps. Where did you learn to paint? At ISA, the, Superior, uh, the Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana. It's near the Palco where I picked you up. When I was six, the principal of the school I was attending told my parents I had a talent for drawing and painting. So I was sent to ISA. When I was 18, I got a scholarship to, start, to study artes plasticas, fine art. I think you say in Leningrad. The cold and snow pierce my body, stabbing my bones, as it does in your country, perhaps. He gives a mock shiver. Yes. I studied, I drew and painted and made sculpture. I met Olga in a, how do you call it? Life drawing class. Olga? My wife. Her stomach tightens. He's married. Of course, Thelma, he's your age. Why wouldn't he be? She was, she was the model for life drawing class. I painted her as an angel in ice. Tomas draws the form in the air. His fingers are long, slightly thickened at the ends. Sounds interesting. Professor Illich denounced it as too religious and fanciful, but Olga was my angel. She helped me with my Russian. She was the only thing that kept me warm that first winter. After my degree, we got married and came to Cuba to teach. He has a wife. She glances at his hand, but he doesn't wear a ring. Water has done this, collapsed the limestone ceiling, scooped out this large rounded pool and smoothed its chalky walls. Water seeped up from underground rivers down from the sky. The surface is a milky blue that deepens into royal blue, pavanine. A word Wally once used in a poem to describe what? Eyes, the sky, a piece of clothing? Not her eyes. Her eyes are hazel. Which hazel, Wally used to call them? They put a spell on him, he used to say. You are changing now? Can he read her mind? Pardon me? Or are you swimming in your clothes? Oh, that kind of changing. She opens her purse as if a bathing suit and towel might miraculously appear there, but all she finds is her guidebook, a Cuba map with the cover half, half ripped off, and Kathy's pamphlet. Her suit is in the suitcase in the trunk of the bruised orange. That's what she calls the car. Why didn't she bring it? What is happening to her head that she, can't, that she can remember the past clear as day, but can't seem to remember the simplest thing in the here and now? Yes, I mean, no. You are taking them off? Nice try. She could swim in her clothes and let them dry on the way back to the car, dripping water like Gretel with her forest crumbs, like the picture in the book her father bought her. Gretel wore a puffy sleeved blouse and dirndl skirt, like the uniform Thelma wore at the gast house by the river where she waitressed her last year in high school. Her boyfriend, Ron, was the dishwasher, got her the job. They used to sneak outside to the mud leaf smell of the Thompson fish lipped smoke rings into each other's mouths. You are shy, not like other women. Which other woman, women, Tomas? Taurus. Swedish, Danish, French, German. Well, Canadian women don't remove their clothes at the drop of a hat. Why? It's a cold country. So is Sweden. You are a brat. Am I? He asks, unzipping his pants and stepping out of them. His briefs are just that, navy blue. He walks to the lip of the cenote. His bum, she has to admit, is quite nice, high and just a little round. He stands surveying the water. She wants to be in that water. 
Kathy and Jorge are obviously not coming. She'll wait until Tomas goes in. The teddy will dry off. She'll put it in her purse, wash it, and later sneak it back into Kathy's bag. Tomas raises himself on his toes, then dives in. She counts to 10. She counts to 20. Where the hell is he? Does he even know how deep it is under the surface? He's been under half a minute. Tomas! Can the guy even swim? Maybe the pool leads to an underground cave. Maybe he's trapped, can't find his way out. She strips off her blouse and skirt. 45 seconds. She dives in, breaststrokes furiously down, but it's dark, she can't see. Her breath gone, she plunges up into air. He's floating on his back, a few feet to her right. Christ, she splutters, I thought you were drowning. I told you I was a diver. Well, you scared me half to death. She turns on her back, gulps in great draughts of air. Relax, Delma, enjoy the water cooling your back, the thin clouds running across the sky. She wonders if the cenote leads into a tunnel and out to the sea. Wonders if the diving gods at Tulum ever swim over here from the Yucatan Peninsula through the turquoise waters of the Caribbean Sea. Setting out from that little cove there where she found herself swimming one drunken morning many, many years ago. Saved when she didn't need saving. She flips over and dives under the cool water feeling it stream through her hair, frustration and sweat slipping off like a layer of skin. How long can she hold her breath? Can she swim from one side of the cenote to the other without stopping? When she was a girl, she could swim the length of the pool in Riverside Park. A water baby, her dad called her. She used to pretend to be a mermaid. When her dad called her out of the water, she'd say she had no legs. She couldn't walk on land. And he said, too bad. He guessed mermaids couldn't eat fudgesicles. He was going to the concession to fetch one for himself. So if she wanted one, she'd have to grow legs quickly. Okay, I'm just gonna skip a bit. Um, and they are out of the cenote now. In the sun, Tomas beside her. The hair on his chest looks so soft and springy like a little baby's. She can feel the heat radiating off his skin. What is that? She points to a bag beside him. Clay, I found it in a bank by the stream. A stream where, she sits up. Near the Casario, I brought some back. What are you gonna do with it? I could make a mask of your face, she laughs. I don't think so. Water drips from Thelma's hair onto her shoulders, trickles down. She thinks to pull the teddy away from her body, but doesn't. It seems that Canadian women do remove their clothes. I haven't removed all of them. Well, the pieces on are very nice. Thank you. You know Frida Kahlo? Yes. Each, each portrait she painted was a mask. A mask? Of her own face. Oh. Look at this clay, he says, taking some from the bag. It is the perfect consistency for your mask. May I try? She doesn't say no. Gently but firmly, he strokes the cool clay onto her cheeks, around her chin, her nose, her mouth, his fingers smooth and firm. In Mexican folklore, Professor Smythe said people who die in childbirth go to the house of the sun. People who die by drowning go to the paradise in the east, ruled by the rain god. People who die of natural causes go to Mictlan, the place where heaven and the underworld join and wear their ideal face. And into eternity, the chosen wear their own face. Which one did her father wear? Which one will she wear? I should just add there, um, I didn't mention, so Jorge and Kathy, the other taxi driver and another tourist that uh, Thelma meets who wants to go on for the adventure. And um, Thelma ends up kind of stealing one of her pieces of clothing and then gets caught with it on and has to sneak it back into her bag. So uh, that's the reference there. <clears throat> yeah, it's a lovely evocative piece of writing. The tension between Tomas and Thelma is 
palpable. Um, the disappearance of Wally hovers through all the scenes. Where is he? Is he worth pursuing? It's just, um, there's a lot, a lot going on in this book. And then you get snatches of Tulum and memory. And I love that line about um, blowing smoke rings into each other's mouths when she was a girl on the on the Thompson River. Um, I was thinking, uh, um, I don't think we could have a book by Elizabeth Haynes that doesn't um, speak to social justice because that's such a passion of yours. And um, in the recollection, when Thelma is thinking back to her uh, field trips to the Mayan ruins, she dismisses a group of Mexican tour guides who are telling tourists a gruesome tale of virgin sacrifice. She just finds it ridiculous. For me, this seemed like a little bit of delicious commentary on uh, first world expectations and cultural capitalism. And I just found little gems throughout the book like that. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit, Elizabeth, about the way Thelma and her sidekick, Kathy, have end up having a more authentic um, Cuban experience rather than the much anticipated marriage renewal vacation that she was thinking of. Can you tell us a little bit about your own views on travel and whatnot? Sure. Um, as I said before, I was I wrote all these um, travel scenes. Uh, I spent some time in Cuba. I studied uh, Spanish and Cuban culture for three months. And so I went to a lot of places and I think I wanted Kathy to be like the guidebook traveler. So she's got the guidebook. She wants to go every single place. Um, she read up on everything and she likes to try to convince Jorge and Tomas about how wonderful their country is. Uh, so she quotes them, oh, your country did this and that, and they're a little cynical. Uh, it's like, yes, but we do not have any meat to eat. Um, but yes, we did bring the children from Chernobyl to get healed in Cuba. And so um, I, I had a little fun with that. I had a little fun playing with the, um, the idea of, you know, the very earnest tourist and, and then the jaded uh, tour guides, they're not really tour guides, taxi drivers um, who, you know, they see parts of Cuba they wouldn't have seen, like they break down in the middle of a swamp and they uh, they end up going to this cave disco where apparently Wally has been seen, which they wouldn't normally go to, where everyone passes the rum ball around and shares it, um, which I had that experience uh, myself in Cuba going to a, a local, well, it was at a, um, a hotel but it was full of the staff and everyone shared the rum bottle and there was myself and the uh, Chilean Canadian guy and uh, all the Cubans wanted to try to teach us how to dance um, not too successfully I would say for myself the Cuban or the Chilean was a bit better um, so yeah I guess in my views of travel you know you see big groups of people um, I guess too going back to the idea of waiting so you know you're when you go in groups you're chauffeured around and okay be back to the bus in half an hour but there's uh some ladies that went to another store and no one knows where they are and the guide has to go and get them so I've done a lot of travel and I, I like I like discovering things I like um yeah going I uh, sort of against the uh, maybe more uh commercial way of traveling and I I like kind of poking fun of it which I did a little bit in the book yeah, I love that taking the Mickey out of the uh, the tourists, mm -hmm. um, which we've all been at some point. But it really, I, I think it's um, it reveals Thelma's character and her true nature, which is so fascinating. I want to get back though to when she was young and she was mentored and she was keen to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. um, she did take this trip to Tulum, uh, young Thelma. She had uh, uh, Dr. Smythe, who's a beautifully rendered character in the book. Um, and on the field trip uh, to the Mayan ruins of coastal Mexico, he says the Maya keepers, their stories and rituals, their view of the world are still with us, Thelma. The past is always with us. How, how does that line inform the Th Thelma's quest to find her errant husband? And what role 
does memory play in this work? Hmm. Yeah, I think the idea of, of the past, you know, I mean, we all know, of course, our past informs our present, but in Thelma's case, I think the past and her memories of the past, which may or may not be accurate, have kept her from moving on. And yet saying that, I don't believe sort of the traditional wisdom that, oh, yeah, you just like move on, let it go, because you can't let it go. It, it stays with you. It stays in your mind. It stays in your body. The past, you know, as Dr. Smy said, is always with it, with us. So even though we can palimpsest, to use a fancy word, the present on it, you know, you peel back the layers and there's the past. So the layers of, of the limestone, of the rock, I guess rock doesn't have layers, but you know, the, the idea that we can, what, what we see now, there are things hidden behind. And I, I like that idea as a metaphor for, for Thelma's life and, and, uh, and, and what she's done of her, with her life, which is a lot, but what, what she didn't do also because of her past. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, a, a, an extraordinarily moving book. Mm -hmm. um, the Errant Husband, I wish I could shake my copy at you, but I actually don't have one yet. And I'm very excited to read it in a physical form. Um, I, 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 want you, I want you to do one more reading, but it, it was interesting um, as the, the quest to find Wally, as the sort of tension between Thomas and Thelma builds, as you know, we've explored her past and we understand her longing for her father, um, for various um, unexplored parts of her life. We, we, um, we get to towards the end of the book, just before this absolutely uh, beautiful denouement that, that is extraordinarily moving. And I've, I've seen that the lines between consciousness and fantasy and dream have become very blurred in the writing. I'm thinking specifically about two sections. Um, when the uh, bruised orange, the car breaks down and Thelma gets incredibly frustrated and goes for a walk by herself. She wanders into the Cuban landscape alone at night and has an encounter with a woman who might be Isabel de Babadilla. And at the very further on in the book, she sees a man on a beach who might be her father. It's it's this, um, she actually refers to the figure on the beach as her extraterrestrial father, which I thought was really interesting. How do these uh, encounters with sort of, I don't even know what to call them. I like the reader has to make the call. Who is this? What's just happened in this? Um, but how how do how do these encounters inform her future and the ending of your beautiful book? Hmm. Yeah, I think in some ways, as Thelma continues on her journey, she is going back into her childhood when she was a dreamy, creative, imaginative girl. And so that's the blurring between the 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 present and the past. But I also, um, I love the movie Contact. I don't know if you know that. Uh, it's Carl Sagan book. And so it's about an astronaut um, played by Jodie Foster, Ellie, her name is. And she goes off into space, but it turns out that she doesn't actually go into space because there's a malfunction. But anyway, in the, in the book, she, in the movie, um, she thinks that she sees her father. So she's walking, I can't remember where she's going to Mars, but she's walking on another planet and she sees her father who has died and who has um, wanted her to be an astronaut. Um, and so I, I like the idea of, of someone from the future, like she went to the future, but she didn't. Someone from the future coming back. So I made the character of the man on the beach who could have been or could be Thelma's father. Um, he's wearing a tilly hat. He's an older man. He's collecting shells and looking at where I'm picking up interesting rocks. He's going bird watching, just as her father might be doing. Um, so yeah, I wanted the idea of coming, uh, of the past and the present and the future all kind of coming together. Um, Can you share that that portion where she 
um, wanders off in the night and perhaps meets Isabel. I'd love to hear that for you. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to try to fix my camera. It is taped on and I'm aware of that. When I look down, you guys are probably finding my face is cut off a little bit. So hopefully that's a bit better. Um, so yes, Thelma is, uh, the car is still broken down in this portion. Okay, sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm on the right one. Okay, yes. Uh, the road is littered with potholes. Sorry, I should just say this is, uh, comes actually a little bit before they're swimming in the cenote. So they've just broken down. The road is littered with potholes. Tomas jerks the wheel trying to avoid a water-filled crater but drives right into it. Now they are stuck. Tomas tries to turn the car around. He roars it back and forth, back and forth, grinding between first and reverse. The engine sputters, then stalls. Mierda. He turns the key. Nothing but the smell of gas. Tries again. No groans, no whines, no whispers. Nada. Tomas lights a cigarette. Nice combination, fire and petrol. Don't worry, says Jorge softly. We can resolve there the problem. I have exactly two weeks in this country before we have to leave. Two weeks to find Wally. One and a half, actually, and now we're stuck in the middle of nowhere. There is no middle of nowhere in Cuba, she groans. Well, maybe not, but if there was, this would be it. Evening descends, riding down the sky and resting on the tops of the mangrove trees like a flock of birds leaving their red flight path behind. Don't worry, Thelma, they'll fix it, Kathy says. Thelma decides not to reply. Kathy's the kind of woman who thinks that everything will work out for the best, but it, but it doesn't always, sweetie, not by a long shot. Jorge and Tomas get out of the car. The hood squeaks open. They're arguing, talking loudly and too quickly for Thelma to make out what they're saying. The ghost of Wally appears again, quoting from Robert Graves through Nightmare. The untamable, the live, the gentle, have you not known them? Whom? They carry time loops so river wise around their house. There's no way in by history's road to name and number them. Why does she like the poem so much? Because Wally does and her father did? Because of the language, the emotion? She loves her references to those who don't fit into the time in which they live who can't find a place in the modern world. It is a lament for those people in places beyond time, stuck in a tragic or a heroic history, this country. We've come to an island that lives in the past, Wall. Every day in the newspaper, Grandma, revolutionary battles are relived. The patron saint of the island is Jose Marti, a 19th century poet. The blowing up of the Maine, the Spanish-American War, the American taking of Guantanamo, why they just happened yesterday, didn't they? You told me De Soto left, his love struck Isabel in Santiago de Cuba. Or maybe she wasn't so love struck anymore, having been dragged across the Atlantic to Santiago, only to be sent on another ship to Havana, at Sans Hubby, who decided to take the scenic route on horseback. Looking for gold, Hernando, you and the Pizarros had the Inca gold. How much gold could one man possibly need? Isabel's Spanish ship was tossed by hurricanes. She had only her slaves and a disgraced niece, Leonor, having found herself in the family way by Hernando's second in command or company. 40 days later, they arrived in Havana recently wrecked by pirates. When Hernando finally arrived, he prepared his ships and left for Florida, leaving Isabel to do what? Govern, yes, a little of that, and wait a lot of that, a hell of a lot of waiting. Isabel bore no children. Was she past childbearing age? Did they die in utero? What was her life like? 
She had a brutal father and was married late to a man who'd had several mistresses and children. Perhaps she didn't expect to marry at all. She was prepared to accept the hardship of the new world, long absences from family and friends and from her husband. Did she also accept the cruelty, fornication, torture, and murder of the native peoples as a right of the conquerors? And if she didn't accept these things, what could she do? What other choices did she have? Thelma had choices, many choices, one of which was to marry Wally, to love and honor him though she did not agree to obey. She is not an obedient woman. Is Rosa obedient? Was Isabel? Or do they just dress in duty's trappings and pretend to be, as women often do, to survive? Outside the window, a half moon settles on the treetops. Tomas lopes down the road, going for help or disappearing too. And chapter 22. Evening. Shadows brindle the path. Thelma walks quickly on a track through the trees, pulling her sweater closer. Mosquitoes buzz around her face, darting in for bites. The breeze is cool, fishy. Away from the gas and cigarette fumes, the pounding in her head is almost gone. Behind the trees, something snorts. She stops, listens. Nothing. She should have woken her dozing companions, Jorge and Kathy, but she couldn't stand to be cramped in that metal rust box a moment longer. She needs to stretch her legs. The sound again, closer to her right. Thelma turns. There's nothing. One minute she's on the autopista, passing a pink de Soto. The next she's on a dirt track in the middle of nowhere. Gisela said Cuba is a safe country, nothing to worry about except for the fact that you're with a Pollyanna and two strangers who say they are taking you to Cienfuegos to find your husband, except for the fact that your husband's disappeared, leaving a cryptic note, except for the fact that your husband is not the disappearing kind. She stops, looks up to see a faint crescent moon rising, Ixchel protector holding her baby rabbit. She hopes the office bunny has found a warm place to bed down for the winter that Hisela and Ardeth are remembering to feed him. The path veers to the right, opens into a large meadow. Floppy-eared longhorn cattle wander in the semi-dark, egrets white riding whitely on their backs. In the near distance, she sees a structure. Barn? House? Whatever it is, there might be help there. She walks toward it. There is something on the porch of the house Something or someone moving in the gloaming. Hello, Thelma calls. The moving stops. Thelma pauses. Hola, she tries. No response. Por favor, estoy uh, lost. Mi carro está rompio. She thinks she is saying her car is broken. Or does carro mean heart? On the porch, there's a swishing, the sound a long skirt makes sweeping across a wooden floor. A soft brush against her calf. Thelma stifles a scream. A cow, Thelma, only a cow, its horns white in the diminishing light. Senora, por favor, she calls to what is surely a woman on the porch, moving slowly toward her. My car, mi carter is, I need help. But as Thelma moves closer across the hummocky ground, the figure seems to be moving backwards into shadow. Senora! Then she's falling, falling backwards, down and down. Thank you. Thank you. There is a delicious surprise in this novel, which Elizabeth and I are dancing around, um, because we can't reveal everything. <laughs> um, it's a, a, a delicious and unexpected turn of events. And I, um, I, I want to take questions from our audience. I know there's probably many, many people who want to ask you about the, the work. Um, but again, uh, congratulations, Elizabeth. It's been a long journey, but so, so worth it. It's 
such a good book. And um, I hope I'm not super biased, but I just really feel that that all that work, all those years, all that slogging is worth it because it's so perfectly put together. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, I have one, oh, I, actually three, but I'm going to just, I have one from Judy Miller of Calgary. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with her question. Um, uh, this is from Judy. Your novel seems to me to write against on the road type quicks up plots i.e. Thelma is not like the classic male protagonist having the episodic experience of her life that will forever after well I'm reading this badly um that will alter her forever but rather is on a Cuban road actually more off the road literally and figuratively reluctantly in quest of the disappeared male Wally, who seems to be having the time of his life. Much humor comes from this reversal, this frustration. Will you speak to that? Yeah, um, that's interesting. I, um, I guess it is, it is a road, a road uh, story or journey, um, but I, I like the idea that uh, it's kind of a reversal of that. Yeah, I think much frustration comes because Wally's on the road having fun and Cubis, uh, you know, apparently having adventures and not contacting his wife. And she's stuck in a gas guzzling or gas filled car <laughs> that breaks down. Um, so, yeah, I think the humor comes from the situation that Thelma finds herself in. And yeah, she's not necessarily um, finding herself through the adventure, but through uh, her waiting and going back in memory and, and having things that are unexpected happen to her. So I like that idea that it's a, it's an off the road, on the road kind of book. Yeah, sorry, I butchered your question. No, no, no. I, I, I Judy, it's interesting, but yeah, it is a, it's a, it's a totally off the road experience and it's really the feminine experience. It, it is quite the opposite of Kerouac and uh, really fascinating and we get to see inside the heart and the mind of of this fabulous protagonist um do we have anything else here uh great reading um lots of little comments um anybody have lots of congratulations um i'm not uh, lots of different messages no real questions though um uh Lee says I hope indigo is selling it well we're gonna support the independence and uh um okay here's another question uh this is from Kay Thornton Lott how did you choose the name of your character Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, people think it's from Thelma and Louise, if you're old enough to remember that movie. Um, I don't know where I chose her name from. I wanted a name. Well, in the book, I say it's her aunt's name, like her, it's her, actually her great aunt's name she's named. And Wally's also named after an elderly relative. So when they first meet, they realize they're named after elderly, elderly relatives. Um, but yeah, where did I come up with a name? I'm not sure. I just wanted a slightly old fashioned name, a, a different kind of name. Um, and I guess I knew that, yes, Thelma and Louise might be on people's minds, which is a, a feminist uh, movie, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, we've got a comment that's uh, from uh, Adele Megan, who says, I like the word errant. It's between a noun and a verb. Uh, between airing and wander, wandering. So that's really interesting. Oh, thank Aaron, you, Adele. Yeah. My yeah. Um, another, oh, qu <laughs> another question, and I think I sort of missed this in my sort of probing into the book, but in some ways, it, uh, it, there's a question here again from Judy said, she loves how the novel is a kind of lesson in learning to love. And 
perhaps I didn't put enough emphasis on that in my questioning, but it really is about loving. And she wants you to speak to that idea of learning how to love. Hmm. Yeah, I think it is learning how to love, learning how to love yourself in a lot of ways, learning how to to love your mistakes, learning how to love obviously other people. Um, but I guess the, you know, a lot of it speaks to self-love and, and Thelma's always been hard on herself and uh, uh, maybe hard on other people too. So yeah, learning to, um, I don't wanna use cliches, not necessarily let go, but learning to, uh, to let people love you, I guess. Yeah. 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 It's really, uh, it's really beautiful the way the different types of love are revealed at the end, but there is that as what I call the delicious surprise in the middle. So, um, I don't know if we have any more, um, um, questions, uh, but I, I invite everyone to, uh, to obviously buy this book and read it. I know it's going to uh, change the way you think and which I think is what um, really good literature does. Um, I think we've got one more. Oh, will there be a sequel? Hmm, that's a really good question. I keep saying that's a really good question, but they are. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm done with Thelma. I might, I might bring her back. I might bring her back, yeah. You must be very attached to her. I know. I am quite attached to her. I, I have this vision of the movie, um, Pierre and Husband. <laughs> Patricia Clarkson will be Thelma because Thelma is sort of thin and blonde, you know, of a certain age. Um, I'm not sure about uh, who's going to be Tomas, maybe Ant Antonio Banderas. Um, I have to find a nerdy guy for Wally. Uh, you know, I like Adam Driver, but he might be too young and too handsome for Wally. So, Yeah. I would like to, uh, all joking aside, I would like to, uh, yeah, see what happens to Thelma. I think I might write more about her. Um, we got something from Ulrich Martin saying, there's a suggestion that life is short and it's important to embrace new endeavors uh, even later in life. And I, I certainly think that's what you will read and see that Thelma changes and has drastic changes in her life because of events and circumstances. And um, yeah, these comments are mostly filled with congratulations for reading and, oh, here's another question. Oh, this is, uh, this is a game, Judy. She said, you're probably sick of my questions, but here's another one. Uh, the book seems to be a study of alternating movement and stasis. Could you speak to this narrative pattern as a metaphor or as part of your own life? Question mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. That first part of the book is mostly waiting or a little bit of backstory. And then everything, once she decides to go look for Wally, everything speeds up. And so, yeah, I think that's definitely very um, true about the book. And yeah, as a metaphor, the idea of, again, the woman who is waiting, and then I was sort of thrust into action, either she thrusts herself or someone else thrusts her in the case of Isabel, her husband saying, okay, you're going to be the governor. See you later. I may come home or I may die on the banks of the Mississippi. Um, so yeah, I think that's really interesting. The idea of movement and, and, um, and stasis. Um, I don't think I did that intentionally, but now that I look at it, that's very true. Yeah. The pacing of the novel is, uh, is lovely and and the tone again is it's, it's it's handled so lightly and yet really you're discussing some pretty deep thematic things with a lot of um import to the way we live our lives so uh congratulations i think what's going to happen now is um if there are no more questions i think what we'll do is uh, uh, elizabeth will stay on and uh speak to um whoever is wants to chat with her and I think we're